and welcome to a Message Light Workers podcast, an interview series created to share and connect through our healing work and life path. Today we have Asha Frost, who is an Ojibwe medicine woman, author, and founder of Sacred Membership, a global online medicine circle community. She has served thousands of people for the past two decades in her work in private practice as a healer, homeopath, teacher, and leader, and has studied with many shamans, medicine people, elders, and guides, impacted by intergenerational trauma, colonization, and oppression, Asha has moved through a deep journey to reclaim and remember her roots and medicine teachings. She has specialized in helping people heal through illness, mental and emotional disorders, and ancestral reconnection. Through this work, she has loved seeing people find their own healing wisdom, presence, and power. Her book, You Are the Medicine, will be published by Hay House in 2022. Asha, welcome and thank you for being here today. Thank you so much for having me. So tell me, how did this all start for you? Were you just born out of the womb knowing that you were a medicine woman or did this kind of evolve over time? Yes, it did evolve over time, but I think um, as a young child, I was very highly uh, sensitive, intuitive, probably a highly sensitive person, very empathic, and I was a dreamer. So as a child, you know, I had visions at night, I would have very vivid dreams, and now I know that my ancestors were visiting me, drumming and singing and doing these brilliant sort of ceremonies around me. Um, but I thought everybody was experiencing this. So I just kind of thought, oh, it's part of being, you know, being alive and this is what happens at night. So it wasn't really until I was diagnosed with an illness at 17 that, um, and I got really sick. And that sort of just opened me up to all of these healing gifts and medicines that were waiting to be remembered within myself and my system and my heart. So that was really the beginning of the journey of awakening to my own medicine through doing my own healing work with other guides who were there to help me on my journey. And that's how it started to evolve. That was the beginning. You were saying that illness kind of really sparked that. Was illness the thing that kind of sparked you to, to look deeper into what's going on here? In a it, lot of times. Yeah, so illness was, um, at the time I was diagnosed with lupus and the doctor said, at the time lupus was, wasn't really, there wasn't really like a well-known cause or there wasn't a lot of sort of information about it. So it was, you know, you're going to live to this age and you won't have children. And they had all of these sort of doom and gloom kind of prognosis for me. And I went on some medication and it ended up being way too harsh for my body. So I was looking for different ways to heal because I knew I needed something. And that returned me back to finding, um, you know, plant medicines and homeopathy and spiritual medicine that helped me to return to myself. Um, because I think a lot of those pieces had been broken through, um, you know, generational trauma and being an indigenous person on this, in this where I grew up, you know, all of these things had impacted me and my disconnection on my journey. So it was like an amplification an opportunity for me to reconnect to my ancestors ways. And did the homeopathy and all the plant medicine kind of, were you already kind of working with this or did this kind of start once you got sick and then you realized I need to return back to my roots and kind of revert back into who I really am? Like, what was that process like? How did you get into that plant medicine or homeopathy? Yeah, so I, I mean, growing up, we didn't use a lot of plant medicine. We, we learned some traditional ways, but that wasn't the way that we were doing healing necessarily. So that because you know my grandparents were colonized and the doctors and the church and all of those things were really um, integral at part of who who they were and what they were colonized into so that had passed down into my own lineage and my generation so yeah getting sick was like a whole remembering like you have this earth that can help you to heal and this is what your ancestors used so let us move past the barriers and heal through all of the all of the things that made you not know this path and help now now it's a journey to remember it's a journey to reclaim all of these things and um and use them for your body and your mind and your spirit when you say reclaim 
what do you mean by reclaim? When you say reclaim your power, right? what is that that you're talking about? So for me, reclamation specifically to this journey was the fact that these, these medicines had been stripped away, they had been buried, it was illegal to practice them. Like there was a lot of um, shadow and a lot of covering up and a lot of pain and trauma that had, um, that had sent me up to not even be connected to that as a possibility for healing. So reclamation for me was to say, well, these are the things that my ancestors used and these really are, is what flows in my blood and my bones and my dream time and my memory. So I, I'm worthy of having this as part of my knowing. So how am I going to walk towards that? Um, because moving through some of that generational trauma can be heavy and it's not an easy path. But so every day I still feel like I'm on that path of reclamation and saying, this is my way and these were my ancestors' ways and I'm worthy of speaking it and standing in it and healing through it. I love that. that sounds very powerful. And to dig into that deeper, what are those ways that you found that you need to kind of speak up about, that you need to live by, that you need to share? What is it that's really like that thing? Mm. I think it comes back for me to, we speak of walking um, in a good way as an Anishinaabe person. That's how we speak of walking in a good way, walking with Minibamazoan, um, which to me means like walking with the seven grandfather teachings, which I think are really like universal. You know, we walk with love, we walk with respect and humility. And my mother always taught me these things. That's how she modeled how we were going to live. So it was always in my presence in my home. But now, I mean, we all mess up. I make mistakes too, I'm human, but I think I, I intend to try to walk in these ways in the ways that I believe my ancestors did and my people have. Um, and we've all just, I think sometimes been harmed or there's been trauma that has like disconnected us from walking in those ways. So that is what I try to return to. Of course, there's different ritual and ceremony um, that I, you know, trying to reclaim words, you know, language. Um, drum songs, um, you know, different ways of smudging and different prayers. So all of these things that root me back to that feeling of, right, this is who I am. And this is what my ancestors practiced. For me, it's a feeling and a knowing. That's kind of how I experience it. Um, and knowing that there's different ways of learning, that it doesn't have to look a certain way, and that we are enough as we are. And whatever, whatever part of the journey we're on, that we're doing our best. And I think that's a really important part too. You said something about the seven grandfathers. Could you explain a little bit about that and what that is? Yeah, so these are teachings that we are asked to live by. And it is said that there, there were grandfathers or elders, I'd say, or you know, medicine wisdom keepers that um, had brought these teachings forward. And they truly are like just a way to live. And I said, they're, they're universal, right? So I think we all try to live in that good way with these seven teachings. And um, I believe that we can all use these in our lives. I think that we can all walk with bravery, walk with um, respect and truth and honesty um, to the best of our abilities, because sometimes, you know, we don't have the capacity to do it all the time. But I think if all of us can do this, then I think the world would be a much more healed place. Beautiful. I kind of, I've sent you um, a few questions here and um, I model these questions to kind of really not only share your journey, but how other people can really start finding their path with a little bit more confidence and peace. And the reason why I chose you is because I actually saw one of your videos on the Winter Solstice Summit. And you actually practiced uh, a drumming session. Mm. Drumming, uh, it was a meditation or a journey. And, you know, at first I was thinking, I don't know if I'm going to get really deep into this. I was kind of very, you know, not skeptical, but I was just, okay, let's see how I, how I feel about this. And then as I started listening to your words, I slowly fell into that space of that, um, when your kind of soul is released or like your soul is kind of opening or expanding. 
what moment was that for you, would you say, when you kind of surrendered and you felt that calling or you felt like that openness, that expansion that allowed you to, that really impacted you to the point where you felt like this is my path. The spiritual journey is very powerful. And what was that moment like for you? What did you learn? I think that moment was probably at the beginning, like when I first got sick and I was seeking out helpers and guides and healers. And I remember I was really terrified of dying. That was my biggest, I was just like, I do not want to die early. I want to have my own children. Um, and I was terrified at that, at that time, I remember, of just dying early. It was like a really big fear. And at the time, it was this healer I was seeing, and um, she was like channeling these beautiful light beings. And these light beings came around, and they just brought this whole energy of trust, um, that there is no rush, that I have time, and that I am here for a really divine purpose. It was a specific message about that. Um, and it gave me a vision of sort of what I, that I had a purpose here and that my medicine was important. And even at the time, I didn't feel that empowered because I felt like I was sick. And I thought as a sick person, how am I going to lead others or help others to see, to see the way, you know, if I'm not healed, but I learned really quickly that part of, part of the most beautiful thing in me rising and sort of leading and teaching is that I don't have it all figured out. And that as I move further on my evolution, everything I'll learn through my own path cracks open and becomes wisdom that I can share with others. And that has always been my way. It's just like I learn something else and then I share it as wisdom and it deepens and integrates. So I think it was that moment I was probably 20, probably 20 or 21. And I saw that even in my sickness, even in my illness, even in my lowest days, there was something that I could gather and it would become wisdom in it. I love that. Is there a common thread that you see among people that kind of come to you for healing work? Usually there's like a common denominator and it just kind of links, like you can, you can tell there's a pattern. Is there a pattern that you see that you feel like just, just about everyone or the majority of people are coming to me for this type of healing or this type of, for this wound. Could you share a little bit about that and then what you offer? A little something of what you offer in healing. Mm -hmm. Yes, I would say that, I mean, I was in private practice for about 16 or 17 years. And so I saw many folks that sat on my couch and we, we sat in healing together. I would say one of the biggest parts was that they were highly sensitive people, um, people who maybe felt like they didn't quite fit in, maybe they're um, maybe not of the earth sometimes and part of the stars, that they felt things deeply, um, they're highly intuitive. So I think that, but maybe that not fitting in, not belonging. Um, I work, I've worked with a lot of uh, mixed, like people of mixed heritage. So, you know, I don't belong to this group, I don't belong to that group, or I'm feeling like I'm not enough of something. So then I'm so always searching to try to scramble to feel more of those things. So I think that that not enough wound comes forward a lot in the work that, that I do. Um, and probably because it's reflected in myself somehow. So um, I think we always sort of teach what we need to kind of learn ourselves. So those are the main, the main threads that I see in the people that I serve. And before it was just one-on-one -on -one work. So it would be like we do these ceremonies one-on-one. -on -one. Now it's in more of a group circle type of type of atmosphere where we are working because I do love that aspect of a circle. We're, we're all sharing these different wounds and these different healings and medicines. And that feels very potent for me. If there is like a book or multiple books that you could suggest for people kind of in this space, what would it be and why? Hmm. Such a, this is such a good question. I think there's been so many books that have impacted me and that have really helped. Um, I really love the book Braiding Sweetgrass. It's not necessarily speaking about, um, you know, about stepping into like your own medicine, but it's a very beautiful book that I think reminds us that we're of the earth and how we can walk in reciprocity, reciprocity and gentleness upon the earth. 
So that's a book that I, I really love. And um, yeah, I, yeah, I, I think that's probably the book that stands out the most for me right now. There's, there's a lot of books. I think what I've noticed and I can speak to is um, the reason that I'm writing my book is because I feel like it'll, I think that we need more Indigenous voices sharing these medicines and these ways. And I haven't quite found that in some of the spiritual books that I've read. So I'm excited for, for kind of making way for that and, and trailblazing those, those voices. I think that you're dead on, like spot on when you say that, because I feel like there's very generic, like in the, in the healing world, there's like a very generic theme. And it's kind of like the same voice repeated, which is fine, but it's like, you're right. There are other traditions. There are other medicines or other forms practicing that aren't necessarily as published or as known, you know? So I think that's really neat um, that you're kind of bringing in a different type of this. I'm sure it's going to be healing, just like, it's just a different type of voice. So I'm glad that you're doing that. Thank you. Yeah, mm -hmm. I'm excited. What is the best investment that you ever made? Um, I've made a lot of investments. <laughs> I've made a lot of investments on my healing journey. I think, um, I think that all of them have been incredible, but I'd say one of the best investments I made was this, it was this course that I was taking and it was called the medicine walk. And at the time I was newly pregnant and I was trying to heal through a birth trauma that I had had with my first son. And I was going into this course and I was like, I want to learn how to do this medicine walk. I want to learn like the steps and, you know, all of the sequences. Um, and through that course, what I ended up doing was processing through that birth trauma through one walk in the forest. And I paid all this money. But what I came through that course knowing was sometimes we don't necessarily know why we're investing in something. Sometimes it's like one magical moment. Sometimes it's a second of something and we always get what we need. So that teaching of investing in myself to get that one magical moment was like infinite blessings for me to know that as long as we trust our gut, we will get what we need. So that's probably the most beautiful investment I've made. Yay, I love that too. What is one lie that you lived by in the past? or maybe a lie that you're overcoming right now at the moment, that uh, that lie was kind of attempting to overcome you or did overcome you at some point. Could you share that? Yeah, I think it's something I'm still working through and I think it's tied to like colonization and um, even a bit of like sort of the patriarchy and how white supremacy shows up in my bones because I marinated in it just about how like you have to push so hard, you know, we have to work so hard. And especially as folks of color that, you know, we're never gonna be seen unless we push and, and try and do and all of these things. I think um, what I'm trying to invite in is ease, grace, surrender, um, cycle, like cyclical living and seasonal, really embodying that and trusting that I don't have to push so hard because I think that that has been enforced in so many ways in our collective energy. So it's a lie. And I am here for standing, especially for women of color, folks of color, that we are worthy of being seen, being paid, being honored for our gifts and our medicines. And it's time for us to rise. Um, and we don't have to fight for it anymore. Can you talk a little bit more about that colonization, how it's marinated in you? Because I like to share this, there was a, I took a ancestry test and then, you know, if you look at me, like you can, I could probably be anything, right? Like heritage, ethnicity. And it's because when I took that test, I was literally a piece of every continent, mm -hmm. of every continent. And my whole life, I always felt like, like you said, in the very, very beginning, I didn't fit in any one place or any one culture, any one language because I just felt like the world is so huge. I've always felt the world is so huge. So for you to kind of bring up the topic and as a person in the healing, healing, you know, field, this is something that I have not spoken of to any other person yet. So could you share, please? 
about that deep rooted, <clears throat> excuse me, that deep rooted energy that you're talking about through colonization and what that means, what that looks like today as it's presented in this moment in time through just healing work in general or just the healing community in general. Mm -hmm. It's such a big, big topic. I guess I can speak to a, of how it's influenced me. Um, I mean, specifically as an indigenous woman doing business, like on a very practical level, um, you know, all of the people that I've had to learn from are non-indigenous folks or white women because they've, because they've had the privilege to rise faster and they get, it's just, that's just the case. And for so long, I try to not see that. I try to just be like, I'm just going to fit into this mold and this meld and I'm just going to do all the steps that I'm being told to do. And I realized that I was trying to like fit into this colonized way of being just like the nuns and the priests had said, you need to cancel out your indigenousness and we need to cancel the Indian out of you and you need to do this. Um, and it's just such a deep wound, right? Because that happened to my family. Um, and then of course we try to assimilate, to be seen, to be in the system that is just being upheld. So I've had to really work hard on like removing myself, untangling myself from those narratives that still are so strong in our collective energy and society. So I'm still working through that. How do I show up as an Indigenous woman in business right now when there's not a lot of people that are modeling that and that are trailblazing that? And that can feel lonely um, in all honesty. So that is how it, how it speaks to me right now on my journey right now. But there's, I mean, there's so many ways that we decolonize the ways that we've been taught. So that's, that's really on my heart right now and, and thinking about how I'm going to do 2021. Yeah. And how does one get to that place where it's learning from someone that isn't white in the healing field or that isn't because everyone that's really, really publicized is going to be, you know, European or you have to learn that information from somewhere, the healing arts from somewhere. Maybe it's their their heritage type of practice. So where would you say that someone, let's say they don't know if they're from a tribe or they don't know exactly where they're from, but they're not, they're looking for a little bit more of like an indigenous practice. How do you suggest they go about looking or searching or finding, connecting? I don't think there's anything wrong with learning from a variety of teachers. Like I think that's just, you know, that's, that's our human diversity and it's a beautiful thing. But I think maybe being really conscious of diversity, like. Who are you learning from? Are the practices and traditions that they're teaching from their lineage? Like, who are they learning from? Just being, starting to be conscious of like, um, is anything being appropriated here or taken? Because there is that level of, of privilege, you know, that non, non-Indigenous or non-folks of color can just take with ease and then they rise and then they step on all of the people that don't have access or, or that same privilege to rise. So I think just being conscious and asking yourself those questions, no shame. You're not shaming yourself to say, I made that mistake or I shouldn't have learned that because we're all growing, but just maybe starting to look and like widen your lens. We're out there. Like I'm here, right? We are out here, but, um, and I've been in this business for, you know, two decades almost. Um, and, but I can honestly say that you're going to have to search a little deeper and you're going to have to do the work to be like, yeah, I just feel like, oh, let me search for those teachers that maybe aren't as visible. Um, and then ask questions, why is that? Why don't they get the publishing contracts? Why don't they, you know, make the seven figures? Why don't they rise? Like, just asking those questions is so important and part of the dismantling, I think, of these systems. What would you tell a struggling light worker to remember as they're attempting to follow their own path? I think... It can be really challenging to be a light worker, especially at this time. I think that um, something that's so important is to remember your presence, to remember your beingness, that your beingness is enough, like your presence is enough um, and that you can change. If you change one life, if you influence one person, that ripple can have the impact on millions truly. So to kind of, really acknowledge sort of all of those, all of those blessings that you impart in the world with your medicine. It's so important. 
And if you could assign one I am affirmation to everyone on the planet, what would that be? I am the medicine. I think that's really important to remember your medicine. I am the medicine. Beautiful. Well, I want to thank you for sharing your story and participating in today's episode. I want everyone to keep a lookout for her book, You Are the Medicine, which is to be published by Hay House in 2022. Of course, I'll be leaving all of her contact information in the info box below. Thank you for listening, and please share this story if it has inspired or motivated you in any way. Thank you, Asha. Thank you for having me.